But the third Orwellian message is that there are a few amazing people, some of them I think in this room, or soon to be in this room, who have what George Orwell called the crystal spirit and who hold out against all the organized lying, against all the torture, against all the massive pressure. He was himself, of course, such a person. Another such person was Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Some, I think, of her essays written from the time of her imprisonment stand in comparison with Orwell, or indeed with the essays of Václav Havel. If you want to look at just one, can I recommend to you her first BBC Reef Lecture, delivered in the summer 2011, which is online, which is a fantastic, just a brilliant description of what it was like to be a dissident in such a regime. And she describes the young people working at the headquarters of the NLD, who were very afraid, and who knew the others were afraid, but they pretended to each other that they were not afraid and by pretending they gave each other courage. I think it's a lovely little description. She describes the literary inspirations, Akhmatova, Václav Havel, but also for us as, as English writers, some wonderfully old-fashioned inspirations. For example, she says that what kept U Win Tin, one of the senior leaders of the NLD going through many years in prison, was W.E. Henley's poem, Invictus. Hands up anyone in this room who knows Henley's Invictus. Hands up anyone. Yes, well not many. 50 years ago, every British school kid would have known this poem, and probably every Burmese school kid too. Um, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It's a Victorian spirit. Now what's so interesting is, do you know who else's favorite poem this was in prison? Do you know who else has kept going in prison? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. And I'm not sure if Dorsu actually knew that at the time. But the other, and another author, who she loved, and we actually talked about this on that visit, was none other than the poet of imperialism, Rudyard Kipling. And she actually asked me to look up for her um, a particular quote from Kipling's Kim, which she quotes at the end of that lecture. And perhaps I can just quote it to you, because I think it's so moving in this context. This is Kipling, quoted by Aung San Suu Kyi. I'd not give room for an emperor. I'd hold my road for a king. To the triple crown I'd not bow down, but this is a different thing. I'll not fight with the powers of air. Sentry pass him through. Drawbridge let fall. He's the lord of us all. The dreamer whose dream came true. And in some sense the dream did come true or start coming true in this country just two years ago. But as you know, people wake up from dreams and then there's real life. And now we're in the phase where maybe the dream period is coming to an end. And it's a hard struggle of transition for democracy um, about which I spoke so optimistically 13 years ago. And let me, in concluding, before throwing it over for comment and discussion, just make three points about the third George Orwell, the Orwell for the difficult transition from dictatorship to democracy. Because you know, you could say, many people could say, well look, Orwell, he's the great writer about totalitarianism, right? But totalitarianism is over, it's finished, except for North Korea. China's a different story. It's a more complicated, really is a more complicated story. So why read Orwell today? Well, here are three things about Orwell that I think 
if I may suggest, are very relevant to the new Myanmar, we hope the democratic Myanmar. Number one is Room 101. Remember Room 101. That is to say, if there is one absolute rule about how you do the politics of transition, from dictatorship, we hope, to democracy, in a deeply wounded, fractured, multi-ethnic society, it is no violence, never violence. On the website you mentioned, freespeechdebate.com, which I hope you'll all come and visit, we have a principle for global free speech which says, we neither make threats of violence nor accept violent intimidation. Uh, two sides to the coin, okay? So the reason we in the outside world got so het up about the Rohingya Muslim issue in Rakhine State, and I think it's important to say this, is not the issue in itself of, say, citizenship status or immigration or entitlements, because all our countries have these issues. It was the violence. It was the appalling violence against the Rohingya Muslims and then to some extent the other way around. And so whatever else you do in the transition period, take this lesson from Orwell. No violence, because the way you start will determine the place you end up. The means you choose will determine the end. And those who start by storming Bastille will end up building Bastille themselves. The second Orwellian lesson, if I could suggest it for this country in transition, is that lesson about political language. It is so important, and, and you have here some copies I see of his fantastic essay on politics and the English language. It is so important to look closely at the language that politicians and commentators and intellectuals and the press are using in such a period. And in particular, to look out for the weasel words, what we call the prefabricated phrases, the euphemisms which hide evasion and lies and oppression. My latest copy of The New Light of Myanmar you can see I'm a regular reader of this great order, <laughs> has um, my friend Robert Cooper being received by the head of the um, Union Election Commission in IP Tour. Robert Cooper represents the, the EU. And he said they talked about various proceedings for elections. And I quote, also, I quote, forgiving talks on electoral process to national races and exchanging views on ideas on electoral affairs. Well, Orwell would have loved that little bit of waffle, of euphemistic, elusive waffle. And you need, as a political writer, to say, so what the hell does that mean? What does it really mean? Pin it down until the prose is, as Orwell himself put it, as clear as a well-cleaned window pane. I should just add, and I think this is important, that such Orwellian euphemisms are not only to be found in countries like this. They're to be found in the oldest established democracies in the world. And one classic example is a phrase that will be familiar to some of you, extraordinary rendition. Extraordinary rendition means that Britain and America picked up people who they couldn't find enough evidence to try in a proper court proceeding but suspected of terrorist offenses and flew them off by dead of night to countries like Morocco or Egypt who tortured the living daylights out of them and kept them in prison for years on end in their hellish version of Room 101. And that we called extraordinary rendition. There, if ever, is an Orwellian euphemism for you. So that second lesson is a lesson about language. The third lesson, and with this I finish, 
is the crystal spirit. In transitions, and we've had quite a few transitions from dictatorship to democracy over the last 50 years, there is a great temptation for people who've been, so to speak, on the right side, inside the country or outside, then to come on board and become totally partisan for whoever the new power is, be it Solidarność in Poland or the ANC in South Africa or whatever it may be, and you end up exercising self-censorship, right? And sort of towing the party line even though you know things are going wrong in the transition that we saw this, for example, in South Africa. And the lesson from Orwell is never do that. Orwell said the writer, the political writer, should not even be a member of a political party. You remain totally independent, you seek the facts, you get as close to the story as you can, you tell it as it is, and you're hardest on your own side. This is something that all actually practiced in homage to Catalonia. And I think my observation on other, country, other countries in transition, it is really important that you have at least some independent political writers who keep that real Orwellian independent fighting spirit, critical, also of their own friends, of those who've been on the right side of history. So that's my third Orwellian lesson. And if I can end in that spirit with a quotation from another wonderful Orwell lecture, which is called The Prevention of Literature. And in the middle of this great essay, Orwell suddenly bursts into an old revivalist hymn. I'm not going to try and sing it. I'm avoiding the bars. But it goes like this. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the spirit of George Orwell. That is the spirit we need, whether in Britain or Myanmar. And that is why Orwell's work is never done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.